element of Santa Claus there and open it up for any questions or comments or thoughts that you have. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions, comments, thoughts? What about Mrs. Claus? So there's, yeah, there's a, a bunch of characters who like, um, uh, Frosty the Snowman and uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, they, sort of, they come out like fully formed in the mid-20th century. They're just invented either in a song uh, or by a company. Um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, um, it was, I can't remember if it was J.C. Penney or one of these department stores that essentially paid somebody to create uh, this other character that they could sort of introduce uh, and, and, and use uh, for sale. I don't remember who specifically introduced M Mrs. Claus's character, but after the sort of slow process of Santa Claus's development, all the rest of these come directly from companies uh, that are trying to sort of market some aspect of Santa Claus. Other questions? Yeah. We put items in people's shoes, children's shoes, on the same thing for day, the sixth of December. Right. And the idea of the root. So there's a lot of aspects of Santa Claus that are really difficult to trace out. I mentioned the chimney thing. Right, and so there are 18th century paintings of children kind of looking up chimneys, and so there's this like sense of, clearly people had this story in mind, or they knew that St. Nicholas perhaps came down a chimney, though it's really hard to figure out when, where or when those things started. Some people say they go back to that story of, of St. Nicholas that I talked about, right, of him leaving those gold pieces, but in the oldest versions of that story that I could find, um, they aren't leaving them in shoes. Um, so it's not clear to me at what point um, stockings and shoes become a part of this character, a part of this story. Another part of Santa Claus I had a really hard time nailing down is the coal. My students <laughs> asked me, uh, uh, why does Santa Claus, wh where did the idea of Santa Claus leaving coal come from? What if I'm particularly odd about that aspect of Santa, it's I can understand now if Santa left you coal in your stocking, that would be a punishment, but coal was fuel for most of human history, right? It would be like Santa Claus filling up my gas tank. That's not exactly a punishment. Um, the, so some people have made a couple of different suggestions. There was like a, a, a kind of a dark caramel treat that parents would make uh, and say it was left behind by one of these darker characters. Some people suggest that maybe that's where the coal comes from. I suspect, although I can't actually nail this down or, or I, I can't confirm it, that the coal is related to all those other darker characters, because all of those uh, Krampus and dark characters are clearly somehow, in some ways, tied into um, kind of satanic uh, or demonic uh, uh, Germanic characters, and so I suspect that the coal relates to that, right? The coal clearly connects to the chimney, um, but I have a feeling that there's also a connection to some kind of hellfire or damnation, and that the coal part of it um, is kind of a, uh, a, a remnant of that kind of older version of the story, that we've held on to the narrative of the coal and kind of lost what I think was the original purpose of that story. But again, that's really speculative on my part. I can't find any historians or scholars that can, f can figure out exactly where the coal comes from or have an agreement on that. Other thoughts? Other questions? Yeah. Do you think there's a connection between this transformation of Santa and our transformation of our notion of childhood over the last century or two? That's a great question. Yeah, so I told you that story about Chris Kindle, and I've read a, a, a quite a few um, either folkloric tales of uh, Martin Luther, right? I told you the story. I'll, this relates to your question, I promise. <laughs> it seems like a diversion, but I'll get back there. So Chris Kindle is supposed to be Martin Luther's replacement for St. Nicholas, right? And Chris Kindle, um, Martin Luther is in the 16th century, and so Martin Luther, if he was directly promoting the story 500 years ago, that he's promoting the story of Chris Kindle coming to kids' houses and delivering gifts. But Christmas was not really associated with children or with families until the 19th century. It's a really Victorian notion Christmas, right? It's this idea of the house as being uh, uh, sort of the center of a family's life, right? And the house is uh, uh, the kind of focus uh, and kind of celebratory place, and all of Christmas being associated with children, that's a really modern idea. Prior to the 19th century, Christmas, uh, the relationship, instead of parents and children, right, as being sort of the two primary uh, actors in Christmas, uh, prior to the 19th century, the two primary actors were the wealthy and the poor. Right, and so uh, in the uh, 16th century in America, one of the reasons why the Puritans uh, were uh, critical of Christmas 
was because it wasn't thought of as a children's holiday. It was thought of as um, a, a, a holiday where the poor would go out and get drunk, um, and they would go to people's houses and um, ostensibly perform a play or sing a song. Right? This is kind of the beginning of caroling, um, where they would do a little performance and sort of request uh, something. They weren't requesting, though, treats or hot chocolate. They were requesting alcohol um, or food. And there was always this subtle suggestion that these people were not so much suggesting it as demanding that after they sing a song, you give them a reward. Um, and so that, uh, 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 that tension uh, between rich and poor uh, is a much older sort of association with Christmas than children. It's only the 19th century that the, the rich and the poor people in that uh, 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 Puritanic or Puritan story that I described um, becomes a story about parents and children. If you think about it, children, um, are in, particularly in the 19th century, are closely aligned with the poor, right? And so it's not difficult to see sort of how this kind of transforms or kind of ends up becoming a kind of children's holiday. Um, but it's actually really late that that happens. And so I'm somewhat suspicious of any stories that's, uh, that sort of describe Christmas as a family holiday or a children's holiday um, prior to the 19th century. That seems somehow, somewhat to be missing the picture. Um, especially because of the kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, celebrating um, that, the, that people were doing in the, Purit in the Puritans' day um, was not really child-friendly. Um, they were uh, singing uh, sort of sexually explicit songs. Uh, my students uh, always minds explode when they hear what passed for a Christmas carol 400 years ago. Um, they were quite a bit wilder than any Christmas carol we might think of today. Um, and so the modern notion of Christmas is like such a modern invention that uh, uh, I'm not sure if, it, uh, if there's any way to kind of connect it to Christmas, uh, uh, children Christmas before that. Other questions, other thoughts? Yeah. Is there any like Christmas type thoughts like in China or Islam? Those those places do they have any kind of celebration that's close or? Um, uh, I don't know. You know. Christmas has such a way of sort of like absorbing other holidays. I wouldn't be surprised if that begins to happen. This is kind of what happens with uh, the Jewish uh, uh, holiday of Hanukkah, right? Hanukkah is a really minor holiday in Judaism. Um, but the fact that it falls around December uh, means that, um, particularly in America, Jewish children felt like they were kind of missing out on what was clearly a dramatically more fun holiday. And so Hanukkah gets sort of built up. There were, uh, the parents begin to introduce presents and uh, colored lights. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, some friends of mine began to get um, Hanukkah bushes, which are just Christmas trees called Hanukkah bushes. Um, and uh, 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 all of those are sort of ways to kind of compete with Christmas. I find those uh, all kind of sort of miss the point because Christmas can sort of absorb any religious holiday or any folklore as we saw. Um, so I always think it's a bad idea to try to compete with Christmas because other religions will lose. <laughs> Christmas is too popular. So that's the closest thing I can think of, but it's only close because on the calendar. Um, there's nothing like it comparable to uh, sort of in uh, spirit. And in part because, as I began to hint at here, but didn't get into as much as I could, um, uh, Christmas as a holiday becomes less and less about a religious experience and more and more about a cultural story, right? That's why I asked about sort of Santa, if, whether or not even Santa Claus is a Christian person. Um, Santa Claus is, you know, on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, um, and those drawings have more to do with selling magazines uh, than they do with uh, any kind of particularly Christian uh, holiday. And so I didn't talk about it so much here because I kind of focused on um, the development of the character of Santa Claus. But the holiday of Christmas um, that there, there has uh, since I think Christmas, the modern Christmas was invented in the 19th century it has always been a kind of consumer holiday, right? Modern consumerism uh, uh, begins in the 19th century with factories, and Christmas begins at that same time. And so there's a reason why that holiday and this kind of economic boom uh, begin somewhat simultaneously. And so that tension that exists at Christmas about commercialism, that's not accidental. That's sort of built into the holiday, right? It's inseparable from Christmas, from the very beginning of the modern holiday. Other questions? Yeah. I was just wondering about the figure of the happy Buddha. It's almost like, you know, like the gregarious Santa Claus or something. I guess, yeah. So people sort of, yeah, the, the, um, there's lots of different cultural uh, uh, notions of what the Buddha is. That particular kind of big fat Buddha is a Chinese um, uh, a Buddhist uh, character. Um, 
And yeah, that, that sort of size, right, reflects a kind of like a, 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 a sense of comfort and sense of warmth. Um, that's, yeah, I think you're right. Maybe that sort of, um, the image of that maybe is somewhat close to or creates the same kind of mood um, as we might associate with Santa Claus, but that's about as close as we could probably get. Any thought? Anybody else? Thoughts, questions? Yeah. Um, all through high school, I had a pen pal in Hong Kong, uh -huh. and she said that um, they left candy and shoes over there. So I don't know if maybe that sucks, you know, like you said, it was one of those other holidays, and then also like very specialized chocolate for candy. Yeah. It was the women buying more for the men, and instead of, you know, like on Valentine's Day, too, it's more for women buying more for the men. Yeah, the, the, the present part of Christmas is really fascinating to me. And again, I, I, I sort of separated all that out from this, but I'd love to give a separate talk just about the introduction of commercialism. Uh, my students and I, in the first year seminar I'm teaching, um, looked at uh, late 19th and early 20th century American newspaper advertisements about Christmas. And one of the things that really fascinated us was um, the way that magazine advertisements sort of teach people how to give presents. Like it was not a natural thing in the 19th century that you should buy presents for every member of your family. So early uh, in, uh, in about the mid 19th century or late 19th century, um, the present part of Christmas is just parents buying it for children. Um, but the idea that parents should exchange gifts with each other and that every aunt and uncle and cousin and teacher and person you run into should also get a gift, that's something that clearly merchants thought would be a great idea. And so there are these advertisements that say things like, if you buy a gift for a loved one, they will buy a gift for you. And it's like the, the advertisements are teaching people what a gift exchange is, right? <laughs> like this is how this is supposed to work. Rather than you buy it for yourself and she buys it for herself, you're supposed to buy one for each other. That literally has to be taught to people. Um, and it is, and you can sort of see it through these Christmas advertisements in the 19th century. Companies find this a great idea. Um, the connection between uh, the shoes thing, um, Part of what's really fascinating to me about Christmas is, uh, is its connection between the study of folklore, because the study of folklore is much more difficult to kind of nail down than things like theology, right? So when I teach things like Calvin, I can uh, talk about what Calvinism is, and I just list it as Calvin's ideas. Folklore is often not written down, right? These are oral stories that are translated. People don't feel the same need to um, uh, be canonical about folklore, right? They don't feel the need to be um, uh, consistent from year to year or from town to town. And so that picture of Chris Kindle that I showed that was supposed to replace um, St. Nicholas, I found these 19th century postcards of Santa Claus, um, this would have been late 19th century, pulling a sled and on the sled is the Christ child, which is exactly the opposite of what the Protestants were supposed to, be, right? The Christ child was supposed to be replacing um, the St. Nicholas character. But this is sort of how folklore works. It sort of um, mutates and changes from community to community, and then it gets reflected back into those old communities. So there are uh, parts of Europe where St. Nicholas is still uh, on the eve of his feast day delivering uh, uh, small gifts for children, and then also there's Santa Claus. Right? Santa is now like a separate character um, from St. Nicholas uh, in European countries. That's not the case so much uh, in a lot of uh, American uh, notions of Santa Claus. Yeah. I came from southern Germany uh -huh. in 1951. I grew up with the tradition of Nicholas, uh -huh. uh, which you say is, you know, predominant Catholic uh, idea. Yeah. But I also grew up with the Christian book. And so Saint Nick would come on December 6th, mm -hmm. and maybe it was one of his darker characters. And yeah. He carried a chain, and kids would get rattling out in the hallway. Yeah. And they get pretty scared. Yeah, there's also, there's no consistency between, oh, I'm sorry, was there more? And then, you know, Christmas Eve, Chris Kindle would come, and uh, uh -huh. after coming to this country as a young kid, uh, I'd hear people, kids ask me, what did Santa Claus bring? And at first, I had no idea what they were talking about, <laughs> and then I figured out. And yeah. I would tell them, in Germany, the tradition is the Christ child would bring the gifts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and uh, it's very, um, I was sort of, for a while, trying to keep track of, I listed all those different characters like Schmutzli and Belsnickel uh, and Krampus, and I was trying to sort of figure out which one was which and where are their stories told and how do they differ from each other, and it became overwhelming. At a certain point I figured out that Belsnickel, that character who is kind of like covered in soot, he's the only one of all those characters I listed that actually shows up in the 19th century in the United States. Um, he also then starts bringing gifts to children. 
Right, so St. Nicholas, it seems like he's taking the day off. And now Bell's Nickel now has both jobs. He's, got a, he's the good cop and the bad cop in one. Um, that seems like much closer to what a 19th century Santa Claus looked like, right? Santa Claus is supposed to either punish or reward uh, prior to the kind of 20th century reward or reward uh, Santa Claus. Um, but those kinds of, that's sort of what folklore is allowed to do, right? They kind of blend together and they kind of end up, they're almost like mirrors. Uh, folklore characters will end up kind of bouncing back uh, from continents or from countries or from communities, and then they sort of get freely adapted, and that's what, part of what I think is so fascinating about the story of Santa Claus and, uh, and how these characters got worked in or worked out of the story. And yes, when sir. did the whole concept of the celebration of Christmas take place versus a, a strictly religious uh, holiday? The, that's, that, the um, notion of Christmas being sort of a communal or a family experience, that's what happens in the 19th century. So in the 18th and 17th century, Puritan leaders try to diminish Christmas. Uh, Puritans actually pass a law that uh, you'll be fined five shillings if you go on the street and celebrate Christmas. Um, people sometimes point to that today as kind of like an, uh, an anti-Christmas perspective, but their version of Christmas, of course, is not like what we think of as Christmas. That was what they were finding people for was kind of drunken uh, orgies. Um, uh, Puritan leaders sort of fail uh, into outlaw Christmas because it becomes so popular among so many people. And what actually begins to kind of reign in Christmas and make it a holiday about children is the Victorian era in Germany uh, and in England and the United States. It's really um, the, no the, the uh, shift from church to the house, right, as a kind of sacred space um, that is associated with families. That's sort of what um, uh, eventually uh, works out a lot of the kind of darker characters um, and darker aspects of Christmas and begins to uh, 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 form into the kind of modern Christmas story that we think of today. All right, I think that's all we have time for. I'm happy to, I'll definitely hang out. I'll be happy to take more of your questions. But I want to thank you all for coming. It was really great to talk to you all. Thanks for all the great questions. And uh, have a lovely night.